My name is Grace Aaron. I'm with the Social Uplift Foundation. It's September 7th, 2014, and I'm interviewing Jackie Cabasso from the Western States Legal Foundation. Oh, I got it right. Hi, Jackie. Here's the mic. Uh, you tell me what are, are the top, let's say top five most important issues that activists should be concerned about and work on. The top five. Well, there are, I'll give you the top two and go from there. There are two existential threats facing humanity now. One of them is uh, climate change and the other one is nuclear weapons. Um, after that, uh, it would be hard for me to, to rank them. Nuclear power is connected to both of those issues and it also presents uh, significant dangers and is not the solution to climate change. But of course, there is human trafficking, there is uh, conflict over dwindling resources, there's fracking, I could go on and on and on. So the thing though that I think is most important is that because there are so many different pressing, seriously pressing issues, um, we cannot approach any of them as single issues. I think the only way we will succeed in building enough people power, influencing public opinion, and building political power is if we can make common cause across issues by identifying values that we share and by organizing around those values and not around the issues um, to be a little bit more concrete. The things that I value are nonviolence, cooperation, democracy with a small d, equality, justice, environmental sustainability, clean air, sufficient food, and so on and so forth. And I think that there are a lot of people working on different issues who share that set of values or something similar to that. And the way, in my view, the way this could work is if we bond together around common values and continue focusing on our particular passions, then we know who to rely on when somebody asks us for help on another issue. I'll give you an example of a completely different kind of an issue. The Haiti Action Committee is a group that, that I support, but I do not work on Haiti per se. It's enormously complicated. The politics are incredible and so on and so forth. When the Haiti Action Com Committee sends out an action alert and asks me to do something, I'll do it because I trust them. And I, I would like to see that kind of working on a bigger scale so that everybody doesn't have to become an expert on nuclear weapons, but if the nuclear weapons movement needs something, then it's a moment to say, okay, hey, everybody over here. And, uh, you know, that's the only way I, I can see forward in the world the way it is now. Um, a very concrete example of that is coming up. September 21st is going to be the People's Climate March in New York City mm -hmm. on the eve of the first United Nations Climate Summit. And the organizers are predicting the biggest climate march in history. They want to get hundreds of thousands of people to New York. And lots of different issue constituencies are associating themselves with it and articulating what the connections are between climate change and the issues that they're most passionate about. So for example, there is a peace and justice hub, which we are part of, which in includes uh, nuclear weapons as a significant peace and justice issue. Um, there is a, another hub, which is the nuclear free carbon free hub, hub which is uh, focusing on and stopping nuclear power and, and saying, explaining why it's not the solution to climate change and offering other alternatives. And then there are all different other kinds of things. Um, there's going to be a conference held also in connection with the climate march, which is the people's convergence for, people's climate convergence for people, planet, and I'm tired. Anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah. But um, they're going to be a hun over a hundred different workshops within that convergence. And my group is doing a double session on uh, deadly connections, challenging nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and climate change. 
where we're going to try to draw out some of those connections. And we have some very exciting special guests, including Tony De Bruyne, the Foreign Minister of the Marshall Islands, which has recently filed lawsuits against the nine nuclear armed states in the International Court of Justice for their failure to disarm as required by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and customary international law. The Marshall Islands is also a leader on climate change because they are being severely affected already by rising water and disappearing coastline. And then we also have the mayor of Des Moines, Iowa, Frank County, who is a member of Mayors for Peace and very strongly anti-nuclear, but also a leading figure internationally on uh, um, the international mayor's uh, climate protection movement. So, and then we'll have other, other folks who can talk about different dimensions of the problem, but uh, we're looking forward to that. And we're hoping that we can start building some of these connections, not only in our workshops, but throughout the weekend, so that we can go into next spring's Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty five-year review conference in New York with more support for a big march and rally and international conference that we're planning there already. Uh, I heard that the Red Cross and the Red Crescent Societies have come out with an anti-nuclear program. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. This is very significant, and I think it set off a number of other things that have happened since then. Um, in, in November of 2011, the International Committee of the Red Cross adopted a resolution uh, saying that the risks, uh, any use of nuclear weapons would cause catastrophic humanitarian impacts and that there could be no adequate humanitarian response, and calling on the governments to urgently commence negotiations on a treaty to verifiably eliminate them. Um, this is, was a long time in coming because, as I understand from high up officials within the ICRC, uh, they were essentially censored for about 50 years by the United States after, of course, the Red Cross was one of the first international aid organizations to go into Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, and they were very vocal about the, uh, the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. So this resolution uh, inspired a new movement focused on bringing out again and examining the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons because the discourse around nuclear weapons has become more and more dominated by sort of national security arguments which get very esoteric and very far removed from everyday reality. But when you bring it down to the humanitarian impacts and you bring uh, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to testify and you do studies of what the impacts of a single nuclear detonation would be in a city and bring all of that information together, and bring it to a group of young diplomats who don't remember learning these things the first time. It's very powerful. So more and more, the first humanitarian impacts conference was in Norway um, in 2013 with something like 127 uh, countries participating. The second one was in Nayarit in Mexico this February with something like 146 countries participating. The third one is going to be in December in Vienna, hosted by the Austrian government. And we're all holding our breath to see if the nuclear weapon states parties to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty come, because the last two have been boycotted by the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom, all nuclear armed states who are obligated under the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, to ne um, negotiate in good faith the elimination of their nuclear weapons. What are the corporate interests and other interests that are the largest players in supporting nuclear weapons and nuclear power? Well, nuclear weapons and nuclear power are very closely intertwined, and nuclear weapons are a very central part of the military-industrial complex. So you will recognize the names of many of the big players, Lockheed Martin, Bechtel Corporation, TRW, Honeywell, and so on. Um, 
I don't think it can simply be boiled down to corporate interests and profit, though, because there is such a basic sense, not more than a sense, I mean, it's a reality, there's a, a, a basic gra grip on power um, associated with possessing nuclear weapons. I mean, so it's more than just corporate profit, but that's certainly part of it. It's the same, um, you know, it's the same 10% of the top 1% who are benefiting fr by ripping off the rest of us on everything imaginable across the board. Okay. I have one more question, and that is, there's an old kind of rap song uh, that with the, with the phrase, educate, agitate, and organize. Now, um, in the groups that I've been part of, generally speaking, we took a political stand. You know, let's try and see if we can get this weapon system voted down. Can we defund this, this nuclear thing? Can we stop underground nuclear testing? That kind of thing. Is it, which is the best strategy? I mean, I think that all of them should be addressed and worked on. But is it realistic to go for the political solution, or is that just infeasible because of the, uh, uh, the way that the Senate and the House and the presidency are structured? Do we have to go back to education? Do we have to go back to agitation? Do we need to get the support of groups like the American Red Cross? What's the best strategy? What's the best estimation of effort? Well, that's a, that's a really difficult question to answer because first I'm going to say if I knew, <laughs> I would be doing it. But um, at the moment, I think the political approach is pretty much dead. And we do not have the organization. We do not have the political power. Um, and it has turned out, if we try to learn the lessons of the past, that... Um, going after particular weapon systems, individual weapon system, has not been successful because something else has come along and replaced it. Um, so we really need a paradigm shift. And in order to, to bring about the paradigm shift, we have to educate and agitate and organize. Um, we are just too small and puny to really make any difference right now. Which is why I go back to the first point I made, which is that I think part of that formula has to be educating, agitating, and organizing around a set of commonly defined values, which will define the kind of paradigm change that we want to see. Um, one way to talk about that is the need that I think is increasingly urgent to redefine security fundamentally in terms of human security and ecological sustainability, not national security. National security does not benefit the people who happen to live in the nation. National security is for the benefit of the top elites who will go to any lengths to maintain it uh, using military techniques for the most part. And so I have found that that idea resonates with people. If I can, on those rare occasions when I get to talk to people who aren't already committed, committed um, the, the director of the human development program at the UN in 1994, a Pakistani named Mahbub ul Haq gave this talk, which I will never forget. Um, I can remember it almost verbatim now uh, at the UN, where he, the question was, what happened to the peace dividend? Because when the Cold War ended, it was widely believed that military spending would decline quite a bit and that those funds would be redirected to development and to other human needs. And he just gave this amazing speech about this concept of fundamentally redefining security so that we're talking about the security of the individual in her home, in her village, in her job, in her environment, and so on, and that that kind of security is universal and indivisible 
and that it cannot be brought about through weapons. Uh, it applies equally to the woman in Afghanistan and the woman in Detroit. And it was a really powerful experience. It says it changed the way I think about these things, and I still think that's the that's the paradigm shift that we need to um, get to because what we hear on a daily basis through the drumbeat of the mainstream media is that you know the most important thing is national security and national security at any cost, and it can never cost too much to ensure our national security and so on and so forth. And when you really examine that, does it make me more secure? No. I think it makes me less secure, you know? I think it makes ordinary people less secure. We're kind of like um, innocent, stand, innocent um, passers-by who are kind of being pinned down in a global gang fight among these military elites. Thank you so much, Jackie. I've really enjoyed this.